This woman is a Kikmungui, or village chief, of the oldest continuously lived in settlement in the United States. When the first successful English colony was formed at Jamestown in 1607, this village was already 500 years old. The village is called Aribi, and the people who live here call themselves Hopi, the people of peace. But since the arrival of the white man in the southwest, the Hopis have known little peace. While many American Indian tribes have been annihilated or driven into a cultural no man's land, the Hopis have held fast to their own religious beliefs and practices. Yet the incessant pressure and presence of the white man has moved the Kikmungui, Mina Lanza, to close Aribi to non-Indians. Yeah, this is my sign that I put this up myself. Because the people, white people, come into my village and visit around, sometimes they don't obey. They don't listen what I have told them, tell them. I tell them to not kick up the things. That's the reason I close my village, because I check them sometimes when they're coming out from the village. I always find the things in their hands. They and stole I, things. Yeah, they stole them. And I always tell them not to do this. So I don't like that. So I have to close it this year, forever. The Hopi Indian Reservation is located in the state of Arizona. They have been allotted 1,000 square miles of their ancestral homeland for their exclusive use. High on top of flat promontories of rock, known as mesas, the Hopis have built their traditional sandstone villages. Here, on First Mesa, there are actually three villages, Walpi, Sichomavi, and Tewa. There are approximately 8,000 Hopis living in villages strung out over 70 miles. Today, a kind of suburban sprawl is beginning to appear. An increasing number of Hopis, heavily influenced by white culture and the American government, are taking up residence in areas below the old villages. <laughs> 75 years ago, these children would have been separated by two days of desert from the nearest Anglo or white man's community. Now they play Anglo children's games and many come from families which have rejected Hopi tradition in favor of an Anglo lifestyle. Later they will tend to work for cash wages rather than farm or keep cattle as their ancestors have done. Yet other children here come from homes in which traditional Hopi values predominate. These children live in a divided society, divided first by the American government and then sustained by a split among the Hopis themselves. Okay, I'm gonna use Hopi, all right? We have almost three groups. We have traditionalists, we have progressive, and then we have the in-between. Traditionalists are the ones that think that Hopi way of life is the only way, okay? Progressive are the people that think the white man's way is the best way. Now there are the in-betweens who wants to take a little bit of the white man's way and they also want to take a little bit of the Hopi way. Those are the in-betweens, okay? Those are the three almost stereotypes we have. And now people, Bahanas, white men come in and try to influence. They try to tell them, your way is wrong. You should do it this way. And the Hopi traditional say, uh-uh. 
This is the way, and this is the way we're going to do it. Right? You hear about it. The terms traditional and progressive reflect radically different views of the world. To understand this difference, we must return to the origins of the Hopi people, far beyond the scope of the white man's history. In the beginning, there was only the creator, Taiwa. All else was Tokpela, endless space. And from this endless space, the creator brought forth Sotugnag, who in his turn brought forth nine universes, one for himself, one for the creator, and seven for the life that was to come. In the first world, man was created by Spider Woman. In four colors she made them, yellow, red, black, and white. The world was beautiful and life was easy. No sickness, no pain, plenty of food. Man's only duty was to honor his creator and to live in the awareness that all being, both animate and inanimate, share in the same life source. But this world was destroyed by fire. Men and women had forgotten their creator and in their desire for power and possessions, they had harmed one another. The few faithful had been sent by Sotugnan to live underground with the ant people. All others perished. And there were two other worlds as well, created and destroyed through man's failure to follow the universal plan. In the last world, an underworld beneath our present one, the chiefs and their desire to escape the evil that man had again created sent Mockingbird to investigate the upper world. He flew up through the roof of the sky and found before him a lush green land and there met Masawa, the great spirit and caretaker of the land and received his permission for the people to emerge from below. They climbed up through the inside of a reed which by their prayers grew right through into the upper world. The people rejoiced to have found a new home but already on the first night, the chief's daughter died. Everyone then knew that the evil they had hoped to escape had followed them. Their struggle to remain true to the creator could never cease. The following morning, the great spirit met them and instructed them how to live together. They were then required to migrate across the continent, marking out its boundaries and claiming it in his name. The tradition of the migrations has given the Hopis the sense of being a chosen people. And for many, the instructions of the Great Spirit today remain the organizing principle of their lives. The Hopi clans built many settlements which they later abandoned in the course of their migrations. These ruins are in Mesa Verde, about 200 miles northeast of the Hopi reservation. The people who lived here in the 13th century were the direct ancestors of today's Hopis and are often referred to by the Navajo word Anasazi, meaning the ancient ones. John Lance is one of the Badger, <coughs> Badger clan uh, member, and he knew some of the knowledge of our people. They came into this area, and different clan groups settled around these canyons. For these Hopi men, the hundreds of Pueblo ruins and rock carvings, such as these which appear throughout the southwest, are the titles of trusteeship by which the Hopis and other American Indian tribes hold claim to the North American continent. The Hopis migrated in clans, and these rock carvings or petroglyphs are the record of their movements, who they were, how long they stayed, and where they were going to. In order to purify themselves and prove that they could remain faithful to the universal plan, they were to travel to the four edges of the Western Hemisphere. If they didn't succumb to the temptation of settling where life was easy, through their wisdom, the Great Spirit would guide them back to their permanent home. 